In the beginning, the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And I pray, Lord God, that that same Spirit that dwells within us, God, is hovering over the sanctuary. God, I pray that you empower Peter, God, to give a bold sermon, that you will empower me, God, just to deliver your word. And I thank you for the opportunity, God. Will you open hearts in the sanctuary this morning, God? Will you open the scriptures to us and give us keen insight, God, as to what you want us to see and what you want us to learn about you? God, we love you and we praise you. We're ready to hear from you this morning. Amen. Amen. So I want to ask you a question. I want to ask you to think for a brief second of a day or a time in your life where you said, I will never forget that day. And just for a brief second, I want you to think about it and think about the first thing that may have popped to your mind. Was it your wedding day? Was it the day maybe that you have given birth to your firstborn? Was it the day that your high school crush finally said yes after you chased them down for months? <laughs> what about when you landed that dream job that you never thought that you would get? I thought about, could it have been when you purchased your first home? Maybe September the 11th? A lot of people say, I'll never forget that day. Or maybe Hurricane Isabel. And as you think about that day, your day, think about all the feelings and the emotions and excitement, or maybe not, maybe sadness that accompanied you with that day. And now I want you to think about that great day, Pentecost. And so I thought to myself, when I get to heaven, I want to talk to David. I love King David. And I know most of you probably don't. Um, however, when you get to heaven, if you wanted to talk to maybe the disciples and say, you know, I studied that Acts chapter 2, and I just wanted to know, what were you guys thinking on that great day? Imagine what they would tell you. And our great day, whatever that is for me and for you, may have changed our lives and some of the people's lives around us, but on this great day, the lives of the entire world will change, not just the disciples. So back in Acts chapter 1, we remember Jesus telling the disciples to wait for the gift of the Father. And they were too busy trying to figure out, Lord, at this time, are you going to restore the kingdom? And he said, it's not for you to know the dates and times, but to wait. He said, and you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. So I remember in group discussion, and maybe in some of your discussions, you pulled away that word, wait, and you thought about it. Yeah, that's the application for my life. I need to wait on the Lord, and wait on his timing, and God's timing is best. And you probably have told some of your friends that in times of trying to comfort them while they're waiting for the Lord. And let's just be honest, it is easier said than done, right? You've been waiting for the Lord to fulfill a promise for years. You probably have given up, right? So, but God has a purpose in the waiting. And we will see here why God told the disciples to wait for the promise. And then some of you guys may have thought, why did he have to wait a week later to receive this gift that Jesus had promised? Why not let the disciples just, you know, take charge and go with it? Why not let Peter just run the show, right? We thought about that, and I thought, good idea or not, considering Peter. And I want to ask you, have you ever acted without waiting for God and acting in your own strength? And how did that work out for you? And I know for me, I found out many times that I was asking God to clean up my mess when I moved ahead without waiting for God. So it is important that we wait because God said you can do nothing in your own strength. So I want you to open with me to Acts chapter 2. We're going to get into the scripture. We're going to figure out what they were waiting for and why was it so important that they wait. So chapter 2 verse 1 says, When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And I want to pause and give you just some little tidbits that I thought was really, really interesting about the word Pentecost. Pentecost means 50th, and is also known as the Jewish Holy Day, the Feast of Weeks. So, during this time, people would flock into the city. Jews from everywhere would come into this city because God had commanded all faithful Jews to observe this day. So the city would be absolutely filled with people, with Jews, devout Jews. And as the notes will tell you when you get your notes today, when you leave, this feast normally celebrates God's gift. And that's the gift that God gave him was the word he gave to the people at Mount Sinai. So I find it truly, truly fascinating that one, Pentecost means 50th, 
Two, that the city would have already been packed with people. Three, Jesus Christ walked with them for 40 days, showing himself to them and illuminating the scriptures to them. And Jesus is gone for about almost 10 days, at least 50. God is sovereign. God is omniscient. He knows all things. Hence, wait, right? Wait. And I can't help but to marvel at the sovereignty of God. He knew that the city would be filled. He knew that this was a perfect time. God's timing is perfect to deliver the promise that he had promised the disciples. So we learned that they were all in one place on one accord, and perhaps they were in the upper room. The scriptures does not denote that, but we know that they were all together and they were waiting. And then Luke does his best to describe what happened during the waiting. And so you guys read that. It says, suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of rushing mighty water, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one set upon each of them. And verse 4 says, And they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So I want to talk about the imagery here because it's almost fascinating to me that it was as is rushing water, as is tongues of fire, because God is truly undescribable. And I think you can think of a time when the Holy Spirit swept through you and you were trying to describe something to somebody and you said, it was kind of like, I really don't understand it, but it was something like this. It's hard to describe God. It's hard to describe him in one word. So Luke does his best to give us those descriptions. And so I want to talk about the imagery real quick. The wind. Do you remember um, in the study of John when Jesus was talking to Nicodemus? He said, the wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but you can't tell where it comes from. He says, so is everyone that is born of the Spirit. And then I thought about the fire. And I love how when God was leading his people in the Exodus, right, God appeared to them in a cloud by day and a fire by night. And you guys remember that God spoke to Moses with that burning bush that didn't burn up, right? You remember that? But then key is what Jesus said. Actually, what John the Baptist said of Jesus, he said he will baptize you. John said he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. That's what he said about Jesus. You will get that baptism of the Holy Spirit and the fire. So although Luke used the best descriptions he could to describe what happened in the house that day, Jesus tells us specifically about the Holy Spirit. And we studied this last week, and I wanted to recap it again for you guys this week. Jesus said that the Holy Spirit will abide with you forever. He dwells in you, and he will be with you. And he tells his disciples, he called the Holy Spirit, when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you of things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. So although there was an imagery of wind and an imagery of fire, the Holy Spirit is not wind, and the Holy Spirit is not fire. Jesus said he, almost six times as he was explaining it to his disciples in John, the Holy Spirit is a person, the third person of the Trinity, in no order. They are all co-equal. Like I said in the beginning, the Spirit was hovering over the waters. The Holy Spirit is not a made-up phenomenon. Some people get carried away by the Holy Ghost, and they get carried away like this is some made-up new phenomenon. And it's not a New Testament invention. The Holy Spirit has always been here, the third person of the Trinity. And we sung that this morning, holy, 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 and you got a son, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. So, I wanted to tell you as my pages are all mixed up now. That's okay. That's okay. That would definitely have happened to me. Bear with me. All right, so we know that Jesus is telling them to wait and to wait for the Holy Spirit, and now you know that the promise has been received. And in Acts chapter 2, you're going to see the Spirit powerfully working in the lives of not only these disciples, but everybody that come in contact with these disciples. The Holy Spirit, in Acts chapter 2, we see that it empowered the disciples to speak in tongues. They were going to do supernatural miracles. You'll see that in the next chapter, Acts chapter 3, empowering them for service, God in the directing them. 
And then Jesus said that they were going to be his witnesses throughout the entire world. So hence, wait, right? Wait for this. And as I said earlier, there was already a large crowd that was already gathered in Jerusalem. So when we pick up in verse 7, it says, And when they heard the disciples speaking in their own language, they were all amazed and they marveled. And they said to one another, Look, not all these who speak Galileans, how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? So naturally, these men would have spoke Hebrew or Aramaic. They would not have been able to speak in the other languages. And I know that the term Galilean may not mean much to you or to I today, but back then it meant a big deal because these guys, the Galileans, were not very eloquent in speech, right? People didn't look up to the Galileans. So the fact that they were speaking in these other languages is a supernatural miracle that can be only attested to God. They couldn't have done any of that in their own strength. But then you know that others mocked and said, they are full of new wine. Now the fact that um, the crowd saw this miracle, right, and they marveled at the miracle, not all were so convinced that this is a supernatural act of God. But we know from studying the scriptures, and the disciples knew that at this point they were changed men, right? And it reminds me of a song that we used to sing in church. I, I can't sing, so I'm not going to sing the song to you, but I definitely will tell you the verses to it. It goes, something on the inside is working on the outside. Oh, what a change in my life. Those disciples were changed men. And from this point on, and we'll see in the study, everybody knew it. So it brings me to my very first principle. And that is simply this. When the Holy Spirit indwells you, new spiritual life begins. When the Holy Spirit indwells you, new spiritual life begins. Now, I think many of you could probably attest to this. I know I can, so I'm not sure if this resonates with you at all, but when you receive salvation and the Holy Spirit came to take up residency in your heart, not everybody noticed the change right away, right? They could have mistaken your worship as being phony or just saying, like, hmm, she's just going to Bible study now, so she thinks she's better than everybody else. Or, why is she acting like that? Why is she telling me about my sin? Why is she this? Why is she that? And just like the crowd, they dismissed the disciples' outward change as drunkenness. And some may definitely have dismissed your outward change as, mm -hmm, yeah, right, she's not really born again. But I want to reassure you of this one thing, that people's perception doesn't stop the Holy Spirit from working in and through you. So no matter what people perceive, do not let them stop your worship and your praise because the Holy Spirit is not going to stop. So let's pick up in verse 14. But Peter, <laughs> standing up and raised his voice. I want you to let that sink in just for one second because I almost cringed. Peter. And if you guys don't know Peter well, for some people who do know Peter, we pick him up in the Gospels and we know Peter to be like this big mouth, right? And at times he was really bold because I remember reading in one of the Gospels where he's telling Jesus, nope, you're not going to the cross by yourself. I will die with you. I will never deny you, right? We know he said that. And we know also the night when Jesus was betrayed, he took that, I call it a sword, and almost cut somebody's ear off. And Jesus had to rectify that situation for Peter. So I think at times Peter was pretty bold. But what I realized as I see his transformation now is that Peter was bold in his own strength then. Peter is now bold in the power of the Holy Spirit. He went from fear, so after he ran his mouth about Jesus is not going to the cross, he will die with him. You guys remember, he ran away and denied Jesus, right? Ran away from Jesus when Jesus needed him the most. He denied him. He walked away bitterly, and I think he vowed not to return until Jesus went back to God. 
And if you do remember, right in this study, I think Bibi might have said it last week, they were all in hiding. They were all afraid of persecution. So Peter was actually afraid at this point. So how in the world did he become so bold? That's what I thought. But he was filled with fear then, and the power of the Holy Spirit, I've changed that word to now, he is fierce. Because he stands up and he addresses the crowd. And in verses 14 through 49, it is the first sermon ever given to the church. And who had the, I call it a privilege of giving that? Peter. So he raises his voice, right? He reassures the crowd that they are not drunk. By the way, it was 9 o'clock in the morning. Okay, so Peter's like, they're not drunk. What you hear has been already prophesied by the prophet Joel, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And so, basically, the, you guys went over it in your um, discussion groups already. Base, the satellite will do it next. But basically, he says, the prophet Joel, God promised, in the last days, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, your sons and your daughters. They shall prophesy. And he concludes with that prophetic statement that we've heard a lot, right, in church. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And he goes on to say, now, Peter, I just keep thinking, I just can't believe this is him, right? He doesn't have Jesus with him, standing beside him, telling him, hey, remember Joel, remember David. He doesn't have a Bible with him. He doesn't have commentaries or access to Google. But he, just this fisherman, is so keenly insightful about everything that had happened in those prophecies. I was almost blown away. I was like, how in the world could he have known any of this stuff? And then he addresses the crowd and he said, it is you who have taken by lawless hands and crucified Jesus and put him to death. But death could not hold him and it was impossible that he should be held by it. And then I remember Jesus saying, he, the spirit of truth, will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. He will glorify me and he will take what is mine and he will declare it to you. That's how Peter was able to deliver these prophecies with keen insight. So I want to talk to you for a second about prophecies, because you probably thought, what in the world? Like, why are we studying something that happened with Joel or something that David had said back in the Psalms? Like, why, why is that important? I think prophecies are important for application purposes, for your life. It proves some very important truths about God and how we can apply those truths to our lives. So listen as I read to you. It's from Isaiah 46, 9, and 10. God speaks, and he says, Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is no other. He says, I'm God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my good pleasure. Then in Isaiah, this is a famous one, because I like this one. He says, Isaiah 55, 11, So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth, God is speaking. It shall not return to me void, but will accomplish what I please. So prophecies, first and foremost, it proves that the Bible is true. It's God's true word. God spoke prophecies through Isaiah and David and Joel. These are just ordinary men speaking these things. But God spoke through them because all scripture comes from God. It reveals that God is infallible. He's trustworthy, as is his word. And God has the ability to speak and to bring things to pass. And then in the book of Numbers, God says, I am not like man that I should lie. He said, I'm not like the son of man that I should repent. Do I speak and not fulfill? So God is faithful. So I want to ask you, what circumstances in your life right now are causing you to doubt his faithfulness? Is it that he's taken too long to deliver? Then you remember him telling you, wait. Right? What is it in your life that causes you to doubt God's faithfulness? It says, God says, I will do all of my good pleasure. So it may not happen when you want it to happen, but wait and allow God to fulfill because he is faithful. So as we examine those prophecies, I'm not going to go through them. Um, you guys already went through them, the prophecy of Joel, the prophecy of David. Last year, we actually studied that prophecy with David, and I was totally confused. I thought David was talking about himself. 
And then Peter not only explained it to the crowd, but he explained it to me as well. No, he wasn't talking about himself. He was talking about Jesus. So in his sermon, Peter delivers the gospel message to the crowd. So I want to just look at it. I want to take both of those prophecies and I want to summarize them for you guys so you guys don't say, so okay, okay, can we get it? First, Peter says, Jesus was authenticated by God. So he was authenticated. God did all these miracles and signs through Jesus Christ, right? The people knew that. The people knew all about the signs that Jesus had performed. We knew about those signs as well, turning water to wine, raising people from the dead. God did all of those things. Then Jesus was crucified. Do you not think the crowd just remember that? The crucifixion was not that long ago. We're only talking 50 days, right? So they remember that very significantly. And he said, this was not without God's foreknowledge. God had already foreknew and planned the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He's telling this to the crowd. Then he says, Jesus was resurrected. That's that one by David that I was confused about last year. But he says, you will not leave my soul to Hades, nor allow your Holy One to see corruption. Jesus was resurrected. He didn't stay in the grave. We know that. Then Jesus had ascended. Remember the disciples just washed and being taken up in the cloud? And they were standing there in amazement. And then those two guys came and said, okay, the same way you see him go up is the same way you'll see him come back. And then Jesus was glorified. When David said in that song, he says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstools. So he delivers the gospel message to the crowd. Only through the power of the Holy Spirit could Peter have done this, not his own strength. And as the Spirit, I told you, their perception of be them being drunk is not going to stop the Spirit at work. Because you see the Spirit moving through these people's hearts, purifying their hearts, and convicting them of sin. And we call that process sanctification. And that's the ongoing process in a believer's life. We will constantly be sanctified and sanctified. God is constantly convicting us of our sin and calling us to repentance. And you ask me, how can I know that the Spirit is at work? Because the crowd's response, the crowd was cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and to the other brother, men and brethren, what shall we do? So it made me stop at this point and think to myself, when was the last time I was cut to the heart about my sin? When was the last time that sin actually thought, oh my goodness, I sinned, and you felt bad about it? Or is it just so casual now that you tell a little white lie, or you might cheat a little bit here or there, or you know, say mean words to people, mean thoughts to people, and just without a second thought? When was the last time that you were actually cut to the heart, when you actually weep over your sin, and even maybe call somebody, a pastor, or somebody, say, what should I do? I think sometimes now sin is just so casual that it doesn't even phase us anymore. So Peter tells them, simply repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remissions of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He says, for the promises to you and to your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And Peter, with many other words, exhorted them, and he said, be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized in about three thousand souls were added to them that day. Ladies, you have just read and studied the birth of the very first church. And then I want to ask you something. If it was Peter standing here right now and not me, and you guys were the crowd, what would he call you to repent of? What would he say to you? So then what is the Holy Spirit telling you now to repent of? The same Holy Spirit that lived inside of Peter dwells inside of each one of us that believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And if the Spirit is not convicting you of anything, and maybe you're just that perfect, or maybe you've quenched the Holy Spirit because of your sin and your failing to repent. And then, don't harden your hearts to the Holy Spirit. I remember learning through BSF that what sin does is it puts a callus over our hearts. The more we sin, the more hardened your heart becomes. So remember that this is a gift, right? So it is not something that you have to work for. If someone gives you a gift, it is normally, they don't, it depends on your friends, 
They may not want anything in return, right? And notice when you give your kids a gift or somebody a gift, it's because you want to bless them with something. And the Holy Spirit is a gift, so you don't have to work for it. You don't have to try to be 100% right all the time. You just have to acknowledge your shortcomings, and that's why God gives us the gift of repentance. And so I want to ask you, somebody in here may not have already received the gift of the Holy Spirit. And I say that if God is knocking on your heart today, will you receive him? And then I get to those lesson questions. And I know you're thinking for um, some very new, new people to be a step, maybe not so new, even myself. It's only like, what, the second or third week? And you might be struggling already and thinking, yeah, I'm not going to do this. Right? Some of those questions causes you to think a little bit, right? You just can't say true or false. And if you're struggling with them, will you ask the Holy Spirit to help you? Do you think God is just going to help Peter and not help us? That's not how God works. And then finally, I love the imagery, right? I, I, the fire of the wind, we talked about that with the Holy Spirit. But God said, I will pour out my spirit. Right? He's not measuring it in a measuring cup and saying, I'm going to give a fourth to Shonda and I'm going to give a whole cup to Didi. He better not. <laughs> right? So it brings me to my second principle. And this is good for sharing the gospel as well. That God gives his spirit immediately. He gives it fully and permanently to believers when we accept his gift of salvation. He's not waiting for you to do more things right than more things wrong. That's the case. Half of us might not receive that gift, right? When you accept the Lord, Jesus Christ as your Savior, God gives his spirit immediately, fully, and permanently to believers. So that brings me to Acts 2. Um, verses 42 to 47. And I just want to ask you, I may have bored you so far, but are you not blown away by the power of the Holy Spirit? Yeah. Do you kind of understand a little bit more now why Jesus said to wait for the gift? I just kept thinking, what a chapter. What a chapter. And then we conclude this chapter, what I envision is the perfect church. So the people continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, we picked up, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. It says, now all who believed together had all things in common. They were selling their possessions and goods and dividing them among all as anyone who had need. And I think one of the verses that I love so much, it says that they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to their church daily those who were being saved. And when I consider this group of believers, I think it was a lesson question you may have had. I think it wasn't on our lesson. The only thing that I could think about being very biased is DSF. I thought, where else have I ever been that there has been unity of the spirit, that there is fellowship when you have fellowships, that there is um, prayer. We pray for each other. We pray for you. You guys probably pray for us. That we praise God. Week after week, you guys have testimonies of what God has done in your life. We share a common bond. These people have all things in common. We have a common bond. That's Jesus Christ. Right? I love for Christ. And then I look at the spirit, how it has united people, irregardless of race and age and cultural backgrounds. Look at your groups. They're pretty dynamic. You might have some 20-year-olds. You may have some 40-year-olds. You may have a blending of year olds. You have all kinds of people in your group. The Spirit of God has done this. And then I think, I don't want to be so biased, right? I think that um, sometimes God gives you this ability to see what that first church looks like, maybe in your small group. Maybe even in your own personal church. I've talked with people before and I said, 
But what do you think why a church should look like nowadays? He said the Acts Church. Everybody knows the Acts Church. We know that. And I think that um, we should praise God and thank God for giving us an opportunity, even in BSF or wherever you have this type of unity among the Spirit. You thank Him for giving us just a little taste of what that church looked like. And I love what the song said, taste and see that the Lord is good. So we should never take for granted what we have here in the bond and the fellowships that we have with each other. And I think Vivi might have mentioned during her first lecture that the book of Acts literally is titled The Acts of the Holy Spirit. She talked about the Holy Spirit last week. I could not talk about anything but the Holy Spirit this week. You'll see the Holy Spirit happening in the next week and the next week. So you will get a fresh look at the Holy Spirit, God himself. And I love to summarize this chapter up, chapter two. I like that we can see the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, right? We saw it from the beginning when the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost. Then you see the Spirit empowering Peter to be bold and be a bold witness for Christ. And don't you like it when you like, oh, I remember Jesus saying, like, you will be my witnesses through all of the earth. Like, there, Peter was ministering to all of these people and speaking their language so the gospel can be taken to all the ends of the earth. And then the Spirit working in the hearts of the crowd as they repented and they were baptized. And then finally we see the Spirit birthing his church. It's amazing, the Holy Spirit. It brings me to my third principle. It is that the Holy Spirit unifies God's people and empowers them to love, to share, and to praise the wonderful works of God. Again, it's the Holy Spirit unifies God's people and empowers them to love, share, and to praise the wonderful works of God. So I want to close with this. I want you to think about everything that we've learned today in just this Acts chapter 2 and the command to wait and the promise that God did, gave and how it changed the disciples' lives and how it changed our lives. But also remember Peter. And remember after he denied the Lord, he wept bitterly and he kind of went on his own way. And Jesus had to go get him and he said, look, once you're strengthened, go back and strengthen your brother. Jesus came back to get Peter and to restore Peter. And I was thinking about this as I was studying, and I was like, there has to be something, God. It's something that tied all of this together for me at the end. And it actually was in Matthew 16, 15. And Jesus was asking his disciples at that time, well, who do you say that I am? And they were saying, well, some say you're John the Baptist, some say you're Elijah, others said Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But Jesus said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Marjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. He said, I also say to you that you are Peter. <laughs> and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Now think about Peter. Maybe in his quiet time or devotion time with God, he probably remembered. He said, on this rock, Peter, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. God gave Peter the opportunity and the privilege to deliver the very first sermon to the church. And that sermon has changed their lives and has changed our lives forever. Only could he have done that through the power of the Holy Spirit. 
The Holy Spirit is truly unstoppable. You guys have a great day.